from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 37, recorded on April 17th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, we are going to look at Paul's latest column entitled Measles is Back. So you write in the column, as of April 4th, there are 113 cases of measles in the U.S. Tell us what's going on. Why is it back? Because a critical percentage of parents are choosing not to vaccinate their children. Uh, you know, we eliminated measles from this country um, by the year 2000 uh, with a two-dose recommendation, with school mandates, with enforced school mandates. We were able to eliminate the most contagious of the vaccine-preventable diseases. It was a remarkable accomplishment. But when people stop giving vaccines, we drop mm -hmm. below a critical level of herd immunity required to keep measles from spreading. And that's what you're seeing. So is it just the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that they are refusing or all vaccines? It's all vaccines. I mean, what, what's happened is um, we have um, all 50 states that have um, vaccine mandates, but um, most states, 45 states really, have either a philosophical exemption or religious exemption to vaccination. So if you claim one of those you then don't have to get any vaccines. If you look at what happened in Mississippi uh, last year, July 2023, for a state that only had medical exemptions, they introduced a religious exemption and 2,100 parents immediately chose it and chose not to vaccinate their children. It's really all vaccines. I think the reason that you see measles coming back is because it's the most contagious and requires the highest level of uh, percentage of the population in order to provide herd immunity. So can we expect mumps and rubella to make a comeback? Well, so mumps is, is here. I mean, we, we never completely eliminated mumps. So mumps does circulate to some extent. We eliminated rubella from the United States in 2005, but certainly rubella isn't eliminated from the world. And there's no doubt in my mind that people who have rubella occasionally come into this country, which was true in 2000. When we said we eliminated measles from this country in 2000, that didn't mean that we eliminated people coming in from other countries with measles. But because we had a high level of population immunity, it didn't spread from one American child to another. But that's what you're seeing now. You're seeing often uh, citizens in this country, U.S. citizens who travel abroad, go to a country where measles is endemic and then bring it back. So although you'll occasionally hear people saying this is a problem with with an immigrant population, it's not an immigrant population at all. It's U.S. citizens traveling abroad and bringing measles back with them. As you know, polio virus is circulating in certain places in the U.S. And it's probably a matter of time before we start seeing some cases like we saw in upstate New York uh, over, over a year ago, I suppose. I think it was the summer of 22, right? That's right, 2022. There was a 27-year-old man in Rockland County who got paralyzed by a revertant strain. And you know this far better than I do, that we have – that strain, um, which is to say the oral polio vaccine created by Albert Sabin and, uh, and released in this country in the early 1960s, can revert to a neurovirulent type or a paralytic type. And that those strains are, are around. And um, I think if you lower polio vaccine uh, rates low enough, and that's what happened in Rockland County, where immunization rates, at least in that zip code, were around 30%. You see diseases like that come back. And, and remember that only about one in 2,000 were so people infected with that strain will develop paralysis. So you can assume he was the tip of a much bigger iceberg. In your article, you give a nice history of the measles vaccine and its impact on measles. Could you go over that for us? Sure. So before there was a measles vaccine in 1963, um, every year in the United States, three to four million children would develop measles. Uh, 48,000 would be hospitalized and 500 people would die. When they would die, typically they would die of severe dehydration or pneumonia or more rarely encephalitis. Then we had a measles vaccine and we had a one dose measles vaccine, which was administered in this country um, through the early 1990s. But what happened was between 1989 and 1991, we had massive outbreaks of measles. We had 11,000 hospitalizations, 166 deaths. 
as we talk about in this piece, uh, the one of those uh, outbreaks occurred, the worst of the outbreaks occurred in Philadelphia. Um, and with that, we then had a second dose recommendation. And so now you had a two dose recommendation, you had school mandates, people were enforcing school mandates, and therefore we were able to eliminate measles. But again, we depend on those around us to protect us. And if a critical percentage of people choose not to be vaccinated, the diseases come back. And that's what you're seeing now with measles. And I really do fear this is only going to get worse. We'll see. So you use the 1990 outbreak in Philadelphia as an example of what could happen. What what triggered that outbreak? Well, the triggering event actually was uh, someone who came back from Spain and then had measles, attended a concert at what was then called the Spectrum. That that introduced measles into the city. It was in, I think, 1989, actually, was when that first happened. But by the winter of 1990, and this is a winter disease, by the winter of 1990, you started to see, you know, 20 cases, 40 cases, 50 cases, 100 cases, and, and, and we were... Um, we were off to the races. It was a nightmare. It's it's really hard to describe how bad it was in the city in the winter of 1990, 1991. But um, people were scared to come into the city. We vaccinated down to six months of age. The state of Pennsylvania gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars to try and educate. But, but it was... Again, a matter of religious exemption to vaccination. There were two fundamentalist churches, First Century Gospel and Faith Tabernacle in the city that didn't immunize their children, and nor did they, they seek medical care. So they were the epicenter of this massive outbreak that when the dust settled, included 1,400 cases and nine deaths, about 500 cases and six deaths in that community, those two religious communities, and about 900 cases and, and uh, three deaths in the surrounding community. So those those church groups had, which had large families and had schools uh, made a decision not only for their own children, but for the community with whom uh, their children interacted. So what was the response of the mayor of Philadelphia to these churches not wanting to immunize? Yeah, I felt sorry for Robert Ross, who was the sort of commissioner of health in the city at the time, because he was, he was great and he was he was doing the best he could. And he met with the reverends of each of those um, churches to try and, and convince them to vaccinate their children, but they wouldn't. So now you were stuck. And what we did was we had a series of essentially four laws that were passed in the city. The first was, remember, these these parents didn't want you to examine their children. They didn't want medical care. They, when their children were sick, they chose prayer. They believed that they that prayer would save their children. And so, what to do? So the first order was that we were got a court order where you could walk into the house and you could look at the child from a distance, from say the door jam. And these were these were middle class, upper middle class uh, families. The children were well cared for. The level of sanitation in the home and hygiene in the children was excellent. And, and so they were well cared for. The parents just chose not to vaccinate them or to seek medical care. So first, the first law rule, rule that was passed in the city was you could look at them from a distance. Then we were able to pass a law where you could actually physically examine the child. Then we passed a law where you could, if the child was ill enough to be hospitalized, you could hospitalize the, the child against their parents' will. And then we did something that has never been done before or since in the United States, which was we passed a law in the city of Philadelphia for compulsory vaccination which is to say that those uh, children of those parents who, who didn't want to vaccinate them for religious reasons had to vaccinate them, had to vaccinate them. And, you know, there's mandatory vaccination where you, you are asked to get a vaccine or you pay some sort of societal price, like not being able to go to the school you want to go to. But here this was compulsory vaccination. And what was amazing, and I'm sure people looking at this now 30 years, 30 plus years later, can't imagine that this ever really happened. The, the American Civil Liberties Union was asked by the pastor of one of those churches to represent him to do what was perfectly legal. We had a religious exemption to vaccination in this city at the time. What they were doing was legal. They were saying, we don't want to vaccinate our child for religious reasons. You would have assumed the ACLU would have represented. Them. That's what we all thought at the time. The ACLU will represent these these churches to do what is perfectly legal. And they refused. The ACLU refused. It was Carolyn Levy who represented the Pennsylvania chapter of the ACLU who said, while we recognize your religious exemption to vaccination, we don't recognize your, your choice to martyr your children to your religion. So they were vaccinated and the parents were perfectly compliant. They were, once it was the law, they were fine with that. And then ultimately the, the, um, 
the epidemic subsided. But the reason it subsided was because we moved into late spring. For all of our vaccination and, and isolation and quarantining and trying to do everything we could to stop spread, it was really late spring that stopped that outbreak, which is why I think, as you'll start to see as we're moving into like May and then June, you'll start to see cases of measles decline in, in this country. But I, I'm really curious to see what happens when next winter comes. So in Philadelphia, there were cases where uh, vaccination was done uh, according to the mandate, right? Compulsory, yes. Compulsory, yes. Compulsory, that's right. Yes, there was a number of probably dozens of children who got vaccinated against their parents' will. What's the, what's the current situation in the United States with respect to religious vaccine exemptions? Most states have religious exemptions to vaccination. I mean, when it comes to religion in this country, we stand back. We say, if this is your religious belief, we will do nothing, which uh, is upsetting to me, quite frankly. I mean, so if you're a Christian scientist and you, chose, you choose prayer instead of antibiotics for your child's pneumonia, or you choose prayer instead of insulin for your child's diabetes, and your child dies, we pretty much do nothing about that. We just recognize their religious beliefs and allow them to martyr their children to their religion. I mean, who stands up for those children? It's not the children's choice. It's the parents' choice. I think this is where the law has to stand up for those children who are unable to stand up for themselves. It's just... Hard to watch. It's hard. It's hard for me to understand a religious exemption because I'm, I've been brought up in public health my, my whole life and believe in it. So uh, I guess their convictions are really strong for them to be able to do that. I, I don't even see how it's a religious act. I mean, every religion teaches you to care about your children, to care about your family, to care about your neighbor. Um, it seems to me it's an incredibly unreligious thing to do. Because you, you don't, you're not caring about your children. You're not care, caring about your neighbor. You're putting them all in harm's way. How is that religious? Yeah, I, that's exactly right. That <laughs> part of religion is to care and love your family and others. And by martyring them, you're not doing that. No, you're not. We will put a link to this column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.